Um, but we are going to be muting lines today, although we do strongly encourage your questions. Uh, we do want you to capture those today in the chat box as we're going along. And there will be ample time at the end to kind of go through your questions and respond to those. Um, so I just want to do a quick check-in to see if our presenters have joined us this morning. Serena and Ali, are you on the phone? Good morning, everyone. This is Ali. Yes, I am. Hi, Ali. Thank you. You're welcome. And Serena, have you been able to join us yet? Yes. Hello. I was muted. Good morning. This is Serena Lowe, and I am on. Great. Thanks, Serena. Um, so thank you all for joining us this morning. We are going to kick off the training. We have set aside a couple of hours. However, as I indicated, I'm not anticipating um, that we will take that long. We did want to leave ample opportunity to go through your questions. So just to reiterate, please identify those in the chat box as we go along and we will get to those as we near the end of the training today. Uh, the training will be recorded and we will be uploading it to our website and we will notify you at the close of the training how to access that should um, you have colleagues who were unable to join us either due to the weather or otherwise. Um, there also will be an opportunity at the end to answer some basic uh, knowledge check questions and upon completion of those obtain a certificate um, which can be used to meet your annual job specific competencies, training requirements or otherwise. So thank you. Good morning again. This is Kristen Fortier. I am the Community Case Management Manager for the Office of Aging and Disability Services and I want to welcome you to our Home and Community Based Services Settings Rule. Uh, introduction to the Individual Experience Assessment Process Training. The training does pertain to Sections 18, 20, 21, and 29 waivers here in the state of Maine. And I would like to introduce our speaker this morning, Dr. Serena Lowe is joining us. Uh, she is our subject matter expert this morning with Economic Systems assisting us in Maine's HCDS Settings Rule Transition to Compliance Initiative. Thank you, Serena, for joining us. Good morning, and thank you so much um, for having uh, myself and Ali. Uh, we're delighted to, uh, to do this training. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen, and so if you'll give me just a moment. Uh, I think I just had it up and I want to make sure people can see it. Is everyone seeing a screen right now with the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Technology is not my thing, but it's definitely uh, Ali's. So between the two of us, we, uh, we make a great team. Um, okay, I'm just going to go like this. Um, so we really appreciate the opportunity um, to uh, present to you today and to have what we hope will be an ongoing uh, dialogue with you. Um, I want to first just start the conversation by saying thank you. Um, uh, first off, it's wonderful to have over 150 people on this training. Um, we really believe strongly that the case managers and support coordinators that will be engaged in conducting the individual experience assessment play an absolute critical role in the state's success for, um, uh, for successful implementation of the federal HCBS settings requirements. And so uh, we really want to make sure that you are armed with all of the information that you need um, and, uh, and tools and resources um, to do well uh, in this role, and given your own knowledge, existing knowledge, experience, and expertise with respect to the participants in each of the waiver programs, uh, we know that we are working with um, the kind of the top-notch um, frontline force, if you will, 
uh, behind the state system. So, so we just really want to thank you first and foremost for your partnership and engagement in this important aspect of the state's implementation process. Um, so today we're going to go through, as Kristen indicated, and talk through first the uh, the federal HCBS rule and the state of Maine's requirements um, for settings, just to make sure everybody has familiarity with this. I'm sure many of you, this is not the first time that you have um, have heard about the rule and uh, spent some time um, on this topic. I'm sorry, I think we're getting some background. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay. We can still hear you, Serena. It sounds like a couple people were having some trouble. Maybe they're joined through their computer audio. Um, and also, for those on the line, we are trying to keep the lines muted, but if you could make sure that you're also muted when you're not presenting. Excellent. Um, thanks, Kristen. Um, so what we're going to do today is walk through just some of the basic tenets of, um, of the rule. Um, and um, sorry, I can see this little thing in my. Sorry. Okay. Um, and uh, go through that. Walk through that again to make sure everyone has a, a, a baseline of knowledge about the rule. We'll talk about the overall validation process of settings, um, both residential and non-residential, so that you have a sense of the larger universe of validation activities that are taking place. And then we're going to get really into the weeds of um, the individual experience assessment process. Um, Ali is going to walk you through uh, the port online portal, which is just a wonderful platform and tool um, to uh, make our work together as efficient as possible. Um, so let's get started. Um, and I think what I'll do is try to stop in between every few slides or section uh, just to take some questions in real time, if that's okay, Kristen and Ali with you all, so that people don't have to wait till the end to, um, to get all their, their, their questions asked. Um, Kristen, in this um, mode, I also cannot see the chat room, so if there are questions that come up, if people want to have a burning question or comment that they want to make, to the group, you can use your chat feature, and uh, Kristen, feel free definitely to interrupt me at any time, okay? I will definitely do that, Serena. Thank you. Excellent. So in this first section, uh, we are going to talk through the basics on the HCBS settings rule. Uh, just as a, a refresher, this rule has been around for a while. This is not something new. Um, in January of 2014, the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services released what we would call um, a landmark regulation regarding the provision of home and community-based services in this country. Um, and what I mean by that is that since the 1980s, when states were first given the authority uh, to waive certain requirements under the Medicaid system so that they could allow um, uh, the provision and delivery of home and community-based services that were Medicaid-funded, there essentially has been um, no, uh, no basic standards or minimal requirements of settings providing services across the board nationwide. Uh, sometimes I like to refer to the home and community-based services field as the Wild West still in, in America because depending on where you live, where you're located, where you're receiving services, it can look very different. Um, and, and in some ways, um, it, can, it, it can go from anything from really being truly inclusive in the community and helping support people live in their own homes of their choosing with people they wish to, to live with and on the other end of the pendulum, it can, you know, we have seen settings that still uh, function and operate and feel a lot like institutional settings. And so the reason this regulation is so important is that it really sets a floor or a minimum bar of expectations of settings um, across the country. So it doesn't matter if you live in Maine or Missouri or Montana or Michigan, you have a right as a participant 
to expect certain criteria within the setting you're receiving services. Um, the other thing that this um, uh, rule does is it, it intends to elevate um, and amp up efforts to improve access to high quality home and community based services overall. And so, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, Serene, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that prior to this rule, states didn't really have a vehicle for making many changes to their waiver structures. So let's say you had a waiver and you were providing certain uh, service models in the past that you now know through evidence and learnings and promising practices and experience working with participants might not be the best models for helping people um, live and engage and be included in the community. One of the things that this rule did is allow states to actually, through a, t a process called tiered standards, um, shut the door on new entries to some of those um, more outdated um, uh, settings and create incentives for building up the capacity of providers for new setting models that might be more inclusive in the community and, and really help um, facilitate greater integration of, of community services for its participants. So, so that's why this rule is so important. And that being said, it is a monster for states to implement. It's got a lot of different facets and it is essentially not just requiring states to look under the hood of their home and community-based services infrastructure and see what they're spending money on, uh, but to really go almost door to door as if we were doing grassroots uh, advocacy, you know, go setting to setting and make sure that settings understand what is required of them and make the necessary cha changes uh, to be fully aligned, not only with the federal government's expectations, but with the state of Maine's expectations. And we'll talk a little bit about how those things run parallel with each other and what some of the distinctions are um, in, in a bit. So I kind of went through this, but um, again, if you want more information than what we present today, um, there is a lot of information both on the main um, uh, Office of Aging and Disability Services, Home and Community-Based Services webpage, um, as well as CMS's webpage as well. Um, but the key is of this rule is really to make sure that participants in Medicaid program uh, receiving home and community-based services really have full access to benefits of community living and the opportunity to receive services in the most integrated setting. That term, uh, most integrated setting, is a term of art in uh, federal uh, disability civil rights uh, because it is what is laid out in the famous Olmstead decision, um, which requires uh, state and uh, state, local, and federal entities using federal tax dollars uh, to provide services in the most integrated setting. So that is not um, accidental. That term, uh, that language, is intended to align uh, the aims of the federal HCBS regulation to uh, to you? our federal civil rights um, construct. Kristen, did you have a statement or is there a question? Uh, no, Serena, that wasn't me. I think someone might be unmuted. I think we've muted them though. Okay, perfect. Just want to make sure I, I slow down it, uh, if anyone That's has okay. a, a burning question. And then did the, you have trouble? Excuse me, there's someone who's unmuted their phone and we can hear your conversation. Thank you. Okay, um, Serena, thanks. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, the second uh, uh, objective of this rule is really, again, to enhance the quality of home and community-based services across the board and provide right protections to participants. And that's a really important aspect as well. Um, while the, we're going to focus a lot on um, kind of what are the minimal criteria that settings providing home and community-based services should have, we're also going to be talking quite a bit about the rights that are afforded to individual participants as a result of this federal regulation. So the vision uh, for of home and community-based services for people with disabilities in the state of Maine 
um, is, is directly linked and connected to the same reasons of, as to why CMS issued this rule. It's to support people with disabilities to have lives like people without disabilities, so like you and I, um, to the greatest extent possible, um, to provide opportunities for true integration, for independence. Um, we want our services to really help spur optimal self-sufficiency, right, for individuals. Um, we don't want them to be unnecessarily dependent on anyone or anything. Um, and so support should be structured in such a way that we're really trying to get to that um, optimal independence level um, for each individual, wherever that's at, and meeting them where that's at. Uh, choice, so not just telling people this is, you know, here's your, here's your place that you're going to spend your day or live, but actually giving them an opportunity to have some options and some say in not only the services they're receiving, but they're, where they're receiving them and who is providing those supports. And then self-determination in all aspects of their life, um, where they live, how they spend their days, how they want to participate in the community. Um, this team has also wanted to ensure quality services that meet people's needs and help them achieve goals that have been previously identified through the real uh, through real person-centered planning. And that's where you all play another critical role in this ongoing work because you're at the front lines with the individual making sure that there is a person-centered plan on record that reflects their preferences, their needs, their strengths, their desires in every aspect of their life. Um, I'll tell you, uh, in terms of quality, probably the greatest um, compliment I've heard from state officials about this rule um, is that it was the first time it forced state officials to really get under the hood of the car in each setting and see what they're funding and that they really started to see and pay attention and note the huge variety of quality set in settings that they are paying the same money for oftentimes. Um, so you can go to one group home that's extremely inclusive. People are getting out in the community. They have a lot of agency and autonomy over their lives. Um, they're supported by people that understand them and, and their needs. Um, and then you can go to another group home right down the hall or down the street in the same neighborhood that is very institutional, very regimented, um, and, and not really um, conforming to the principles of home and community-based. And so states have started to really realize that they, in many cases, they're paying the same money uh, for two settings in the same service delivery model that could look extremely different in terms of quality. And so that's another reason that CMS issued this rule. The rule really provides an opportunity to expand the capacity of providers for more integrated and individualized services and to try to shift away from some of those more segregated, large, congregate, facility-based models um, that meet, in order to meet um, you know, the, the growing demand from people with disabilities uh, to, again, have service structures that are nimble and flexible and help them uh, attain the goals that they've set forth for themselves. Um, ensure basic rights of individuals in all HCBS settings and then help states comply with Americans with Disabilities Act and Olmstead. I should say from the beginning that even if a state is fully and has fully implemented the statewide transition plan, that does not mean that they are uh, fully adhering to Title One of the Americans or Title Two, excuse me, of Americans with Disabilities Act, but it certainly gets them in a much better place in terms of um, alignment with um, the outcomes of the Olmstead decision from a civil rights perspective. Um, so the federal uh, HCBS rule has some general requirements that all settings. It doesn't matter if they're provider-owned and controlled. It doesn't matter if they're residential or non-residential. All settings where people are receiving um, services funded by Medicaid uh, should, should possess. And 
um, and it's focused on the nature and quality of individuals' experiences. So these next couple of slides walk through those general requirements, and these are requirements that you will be um, uh, asking about in the questions within the IEA. And so um, there's the, um, you know, whether the setting is integrated in and supports access to the greater community, whether it provides opportunities to seek employment and work in competitive integrated settings, engage in community life, and control personal resources, and whether it was selected by the individual from among setting options, including non-disability specific options. So that, that third requirement here is not necessarily something that a provider is responsible for, but it is something that states and their case management systems are responsible for, really making sure that when individuals are deciding where to receive services, what providers to work with, that there was a non-disability specific option provided to them, either living in their own home, living in a shared living experience in the state, um, receiving uh, supports to allow them to be in the community as opposed during their day, as opposed to into a facility, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is a continuation of those general requirements. There are four others, um, so there's a total of seven that are expected of all settings. Um, uh, the fourth is that uh, the setting ensures the individual is receiving services in the community to the same degree of access as individuals not receiving Medicaid home and community-based services. So if there is a young adult with autism who likes to go to the movies and wants to go to the movies at, uh, and lives in a group home and wants to go to the movies um, uh, two days a week and is told that they can only go to the movies once a month when it is allowed for, when there's a special um, theater showing a movie specific, um, with specific, uh, um, that's specifically targeted for people with intellectual disabilities, that's probably not okay. That should be an option to that person, but that sh the person shouldn't be restricted unnecessarily. Um, so that's just an example. Um, the, the setting ensures an individual's rights of privacy, of dignity, respect, and freedom from coercion and restraint. And the freedom from coercion and restraint is a really tough one um, because coercion is often done in such a subtle way and, and it's also, I like to believe, is done many times by people who don't even realize that they are being coercive. And so, um, so a lot of the questions that our on-site validation team is asking that you'll be posing is to really try to get at that issue of are individual participants being coerced into making certain decisions um, that might not be in their best interest or not really be aligned with the person-centered plan, um, or, or is that not occurring? Restraint is another one, uh, particularly in states like Maine that have you know, a behavioral health modification um, system that's, that's separate and distinct from this rule. Um, optimizing individual, the setting also needs to optimize individual initiative, autonomy and independence and in making life choices and facilitating individual choice regarding services and supports and who provides them. Now beyond these general requirements expected of all home and community-based settings, there are additional requirements for provider-owned and controlled residential and in the state of Maine, non-residential settings. So for any provider-owned or controlled setting in the state of Maine, regardless of if it's residential or non-residential, the setting must allow participants to control their own schedule, meaning they have a say in making their schedule, in the activities that are laid out in the schedule, and who, and who they're spending time with, um, et cetera, on, on and on. Um, they, uh, the setting must also provide participants access to food at any time, afford participants the right to visitors of their choosing at any time, and assure that the setting is physically accessible. Uh, residential provider-owned and controlled settings 
So assisted living, family-centered homes, shared living um, where there's a paid provider, um, and uh, group homes must also assure that, parent, that participants have a lease or another residential agreement that has the same level of legal protections against eviction as state tenant law allows for. Um, privacy and lockable doors for his or her own unit, which should include the entry into the actual home, um, the bedroom, and the individual's bathroom doors. Um, that there's a choice of roommate um, and, um, and that there's a freedom to furnish or decorate the unit as they wish. Um, the Sunnies also um, ensures these basic rights for people uh, with disabilities in their homes, but does allow for modifications to be made based on health and safety under very specific circumstances. And the only modifications that can be applied are those related to provider-owned and controlled settings. So for example, someone that might have uh, PICA and may not be able to have unlimited access to food. That is something that can be modified um, through the person-centered plan. Um, the modifications, however, have to be based on individuals' needs and not on the convenience of a provider. So if you go and start doing individual experience assessments and you see a trend in people saying that they only that they can't have snacks after 8 o'clock at night or they're not able to have food after 8 o'clock at night. But you're not understanding why that would be a modification for an entire group home. Chances are it probably shouldn't be a modification for every individual in a group home. And so those are the kinds of things that you want to look for um, when you're conducting the IEAs. Um, they also have to be out, um, articulated through the person-centered planning process. So it's not, modifications can't be made like after a person comes in unless it's revisited in the person-centered plan. Any modifications of provider owned and controlled requirements have to be supported by specific assessed need at an individual level, have to be justified in the person-centered plan. And when we talk about justification, there has to not only be a health and safety need attached, but there has to be documentation included that demonstrates that there were less restrictive alternative strategies that were already attempted and that those were really unsuccessful and thus um, is justifying this modification to the home and community-based services settings criteria. Um, those modifications need to be reviewed periodically to determine whether they continue to be necessary and it's very, this is really important information for case managers to keep in mind as you're completing the IEAs because you are also at the front lines of knowing what are in individuals' person center plans. So you can, you can maybe, you know, and there, there will be more training on this after today because we could spend an entire hour just talking about this issue, but really being in tune with um, what you're getting in feedback from participants about how they're experiencing the setting, what kind of parameters have been put in place um, versus uh, what you know to be in their person-centered plan um, provides you with an expert insight that is really um, uh, tremendously valuable to the state in this work. Uh, states must assess and categorize all settings um, meaning every single setting has to be um, assessed and validated uh, to determine whether or not they are home and community based in nature and to assure that they either are complying or will fully comply with each of the criteria we just went through. Um, so, um, so this is just a, a sense of what settings can never meet the requirements of the rule, um, and there's a number of them um, because they're institutions. So nursing homes, um, intermediate care facilities, hospitals, uh, intermediate uh, uh, or institutions for mental diseases, PNMIs, none of those are ever considered home and community based. If you get assigned to um, go see someone uh, and 
do an IEA and and for some reason your your client is is in one of these that that's definitely a red flag and should and should not be happening. We do not anticipate that to happen. Um, settings that are in the same building as any public or private facility providing inpatient treatment or settings that are in the grounds of or adjacent to a public institution are also institutional in nature and thus cannot be home and community based. And, and that's, that's um, kind of the, the uh, construct of, of the state of means requirements. Um, there are also settings that are presumed institutional, which means um, a setting that is unallowable because they possess the, uh, characteristics that isolate individuals from, um, from the greater community and that those really are not going to be allowed um, at the end of the transition period unless the state can prove through a heightened scrutiny process that the setting overcomes those isolating characteristics and meets the rules requirements. So before we move forward, I just want to stop for a second, pause, and see if there's been any questions that have come up in the chat box um, uh, or any comments um, from, from Kristen or my colleagues from EconSys regarding the rules, uh, the rules criteria itself. Serena, we do actually have a question from Amanda in regards to HCBS um, modifications. So the question is, um, with regard to specific home modifications, we have an individual with Crater Willie. He and his roommate want to live together, and both are in agreement for the modification for one. The other has access to food at all times. We have heard that they may no longer be able to stay together as his modification is not needed for the other individual. They are concerned that they will be separated with this new rule. Do you have any guidance on this? Uh, sure. By what is described right there, there, is, there should be no change in that. What I'm understanding is that the roomie who does not have Prater's Willie has access to food at all times and uh, lives with uh, a roommate with Prater's Willies who does have some restrictions and understands those restrictions and respects those, but, but as an individual still has access to food when they want it. So there is no issue. And, um, and, and that's the kind of feedback that's really helpful to us as we continue to help support the state in getting good information out about the rule, about what it does and what it doesn't. But there should be no problem with those two individuals continuing to be roommates together. Thanks, Serena. Sure. We, have another, we have another question from Karen. Karen says, I have clients living in PNMI settings who have waiver 29 access to community. Are those still okay? I'm not sure specifically what she's referencing. Um, so, Karen, if you can give any more detail to help us understand, that, that would be great. Yeah, I'll take a shot on it. I don't know if Dr. Lisa Mills has joined us, but I encourage her to jump in as well. Um, but uh, PNMI is considered an institutional setting by nature. Um, that does not, it, I'm presuming that the services provided under Section 29 are allowing or supporting the individual pursuing activities in the community potentially during the day. Those are allowed. Um, uh, the PNMI itself will not be under evaluation uh, by the case manager. Um, only the, um, the experience of the individual in terms of the services they receive through the Section 29 waiver that will be the through which the, the lens through which the case manager will be conducting the IEA. And I know that probably sounds a little bit like splitting hairs, um, but there was, and just to go back historically a little bit on this, the federal rule did include in its preamble this, this assumption that individuals receiving services 
um, Medicaid funded home and community based services and then from a non residential setting, in other words, to participate in the community would and should also be living then in settings that were home and community based in nature. However, CMS then came out a couple of years ago and said, you know, we understand that neither we nor state Medicaid systems actually have a way to enforce that. The only way we can enforce it is if our Medicaid home and community-based services are being provided in the residential setting. And so, um, so that's where we kind of draw the line. The state has, um, class, has reclassified PNMI as institutional settings, and as such, uh, we won't be performing uh, any validation work with respect to those settings directly, but we will be performing um, validation work related to the ancillary home and community-based services the individual receives through Section 29. I hope that's helpful a little bit. Thanks, Serena. I think it was very helpful. Um, we have a question from Holly around transportation. How does transportation fit into this? Such as a person who is living alone but does not drive mm -hmm. and wants to attend the movies or go to the beach but doesn't need staff support except for a driver. So uh, transportation is always, and this is one that is getting a little deeper in the weeds and is probably deserving of, a, of its own focused topic at a, a subsequent training. So I'll, I'll try to give a very brief answer right now in the hopes that we'll have some more time to kind of focus on transportation. And there are questions in the IEA related to transportation. Um, so the key is, does the person have reasonable access to activities in the broader community. And it should always be looked at from the lens of where the person lives and what are the experiences of the people in the community with which they live. So if they're in like a, a suburban neighborhood, are there places the individual could walk? Is there public bus systems that the person has been supported in learning and utilizing? Um, if they're in a rural area, then the, the comparison is similar to what other people in that rural community experience. So if the, if the you know, typical um, resident of a rural area in, in Maine, you know, goes to the downtown area or to the market, you know, twice a week, it would be expected that the individual living in that community has similar access. Um, uh, in terms of frequency and, and destinations. Transportation is a tricky thing. There is no, it's more of an art than a science. And so there's not like a quantitative set of instructions you're gonna get as a case manager saying this person has to have, you know, A, B, C, and D in place in terms of transportation options. But what you do wanna do is try to identify through the IEA and the questions that have been put in there specifically to help you gouge this, this information um, is, is transportation being used as an excuse to block someone's participation in the community? So, you know, have natural supports been exhausted? You know, do they have a neighbor down the street that can pick them up and take them to the YMCA a couple of times a week so they can go swim? Um, it, again, is there a bus system that is accessible that nobody has, you know, actually taught the person how to uh, use? I mean, maybe that's something that needs to go in as a goal in their person-centered plan. So um, we'll spend some more time on transportation and access to the greater community in a subsequent uh, webinar, uh, but we probably do need to kind of move forward um, into the next section. So definitely uh, let's put this, Kristen, on like our key topics for upcoming um, additional TA to the case managers, because that, that is a really important one. Absolutely, Serena, thank you. You bet. I think I'll go ahead and um, transition into our next section, um, just in the interest of time, and then we'll pause again in a few minutes and take some additional questions um, and then get into the IEA. So in terms of validating the setting validation process, 
um, it's important to understand what the state was required to do. So the state first and foremost completed a self-assessment process with um, its providers to let the providers kind of tell the state where they thought they were at in terms of um, complying with each of the settings criteria. And that exercise was important for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, um, to get some baseline trend data on areas where um, there might be a lot of noncompliance in meeting one or more settings criteria across a category of setting or a waiver program. Um, number two, it was also important to kind of get a sense of how do providers understand this criteria and the settings requirements, um, and and do they you know do they really um, you know what what's the level of knowledge base um, that um, is going to be required? Thus, what might be some important investments and in areas that the state needs to focus more heavily on in the future in terms of tr additional training? Um, and ongoing technical assistance support to providers. So um, that's why that self-assessment process is so important. But, the, but CMS also requires um, a really critical piece of this, and that is called validation. And the validation has to be done independent of the provider self-assessments. And why is that important? Well, because even the most altruistic provider out there is um, <laughs> it has is, is looking at this work from a very different lens and may not always be objective or have the best interest of the participant at heart. And I don't mean that in any kind of uh, prerogatory way um, or prerogative way um, or negative towards a provider. I'm just saying all of us come to the table with specific self-interest at heart. And so it's really important for the state to be able to get additional data to validate whether or not those res initial responses received by uh, providers um, was, uh, was accurate. Um, so the state of Maine is deploying um, kind of a, a, a two-step process um, uh, with this. They've done the self-assessments. Now they're doing the validation work um, with, um, through a number of independent vehicles. This slide just kind of shows you what the process looks like. So there was the provider self-assessment, and now we're doing the validation of those responses through a number of different activities, on-site reviews, individual experience assessments, and or desk reviews. Um, once those validation activities are completed, uh, providers are notified of any areas where we saw gaps in compliance, where they either partially complied or didn't comply at all with specific criteria, and then with instructions for the development of a plan for remediating those issues. Um, and then uh, after the remediation is completed, there'll be a final confirmation that those have been completed, and then there will be ongoing compliance monitoring of the settings for the long haul. And the IEA is actually going to be a critical part of that ongoing monitoring as well. Uh, so this is not a, uh, unfortunately, guys, this is not a one and done thing for you all <laughs> in the future. You're a, a critical partner in all of this. Um, so the first method that the state is deploying is they are taking a subset of settings across each category of setting and across Weaver programs in conducting an on-site visit. There have been 644 settings approximately that have been identified to receive on-site visits. Um, they include 100% of the non-residential setting types that are in Medicaid, um, uh, Maine's Medicaid HCBS funded system. So all community supports, uh, group work support pro, uh, settings, and clubhouse settings will receive an on-site visit. Um, there will also be a sample of approximately 24% of all group homes, whether they be one to two person, three to five person, or six uh, person plus, um, family-centered homes, shared living and, uh, with related family members, and shared living with unrelated providers uh, that will be captured in that sample. Um, 
The selection criteria is that we made sure they were proportional, uh, that there was a proportional selection of settings uh, by district or geography, that there's a random selection of settings for some of the residential setting types, and that there's a maximum number of distinct providers, because as you know, there, oftentimes you'll have a provider that's responsible for several different settings. So we want to make sure there's also that as many providers are being covered in that on-site validation sample as possible. So the good news is, is that for those 644 settings, uh, you will not be engaged or responsible for conducting independent, <laughs> I'm sorry, individual experience assessments. Um, the other news on that is that you actually will be part of the 1600 plus settings that are not receiving an ongoing uh, validation. So this just gives you a sense of the provider self-assessments that were completed. We had 100% uh, response rate um, uh, across the non-residential provider assessments, and we had uh, a 97% response rate among the residential settings. I, my understanding is that, that any settings that did not submit a provider self-assessment will obviously be flagged and prioritized for an on-site on validation. Um, and this just kind of shows you the, the breakdown of um, providers that are serving fewer than one, in, uh, one or more individuals and um, so on and so forth. So the plan for the on-site um, uh, visit um, is as follows. And we're just giving this to you by way of background. Um, but the contract, uh, the state has contracted with Econ, CIS, or Economic Systems, um, which Dr. Mills and myself are, are part of, um, and, and Ali Sayer um, is the project director, Lisa Mills is the project manager, and I'm a subject matter expert supporting uh, their work. Um, the Econ CIS has been contracted, subcontracted with the approval of the state with Disability Rights Maine to conduct the on-site validation visits. Um, we've worked together as a team with the state to create validation tools specific to those on-site visits, one for residential and one for non-residential. Uh, we've conducted a very extensive validation, validator training. Um, the, the DRM has hired seven or eight um, validators, um, so it's a team, and they are spread out across the state geographically, so um, each team member will be conducting um, site visits in their locale. Um, and, um, and then we also, after they received two days of in-depth training, um, I was up there and uh, DRM and myself uh, took these validators out and spent two days in the field with them. Actually, it's about a day because your snowstorm last week, uh, things got canceled on Thursday. But we, we spent some time doing on -site val conducting on-site visits and going through the validation process to kind of tweak things, see what works and what doesn't um, during uh, that work. Um, the on-site visits will occur on a rolling basis between now and October. So that's obviously a, a pretty compressed amount of time. Um, and um, and so, uh, you know, we'll be working very steadfastly in, in that effort. Um, this is a breakdown, the slide, of the number of uh, settings out of the total number for each setting type that we'll receive an on-site visit. Again, just background for your situational awareness because you're you're a big part of this larger validation work that's going on. Uh, the one thing I also just want to say about um, the on-site visits before we really get into the IEA piece is that the validators um, in an on-site visit have approximately four hours to complete the following. Um, a review of the provider's policies of, of interest um, and, um, and processes. Uh, they need to do a full uh, physical site tour. Um, they will interview um, not only leadership um, from the provider organization, but also uh, staff individually and confidentially. Um, and then they will conduct a shortened version of the IEA on a specific number, representative sample. I shouldn't say representative sample because that has a statistical significance to it, but a sample 
of the participants that are on site that day. And so, um, and before they do that, they'll review um, those individuals' person-centered plans. So it's a lot of work, it's really comprehensive. That's why the state uh, is not able to do, you know, that extensive of a validation process for all 22 or 2400 settings that you guys have. Which is why the second method is so important, because this will serve as the initial validation uh, strategy for um, the for the majority of the settings in your system. Um, and what's, the settings that are included in the IEA are all residential settings that do not receive an on-site visit. So you're off the hook for non-residential settings right now, and also for any residential settings that are getting an on-site validation. Uh, the support coordinator, care coordinator, case manager, depending on what waiver system you're in, um, will conduct an in-person IEA in the setting with each member and a guardian if one is appointed and wishes to be a part of the process, receiving services in the setting. Um, information will be compared with from uh, the, the results and responses of those IEAs with the provider self-assessment, and those will um, be conducted to determine uh, current compliance with any areas of partial or not um, uh, or non-compliance that need to be addressed. Um, and it's also intended to identify concerns when there's a lack of alignment between a provider self-assessment responses, you know, how a provider responded to certain issues and whether um, or not um, those comport with the IEA findings. When there is a significant lack of alignment, um, the IEA will uh, trigger um, either a desk review by state personnel or even an on-site visit. So you're like, again, at the front lines of this um, work and, and really helping us ident you know, determine whether there's consistencies between how participants are expressing how they're experiencing a setting and what the provider said um, is how they operate. Um, that, that is just critical to this validation work. In a situation where um, it does appear that there's been a trend in discrepancies identified between the provider self-assessment responses and the results of the um, individual experience assessments, a desk level review will be the next step in the process that will be completed um, internally by state staff that have been identified. Um, and the provider will be contacted to submit additional information and documentation to support answers in the self-assessment that were inconsistent with the IEA and to clear up any areas of concern. Um, uh, the Office of Aging and Disability Services, again, have identified staff for this work, um, and ACONSIS is working with the state to develop what the desk review process and procedures and what documentation will be requested, what that will look like. Uh, those reviews, it says will occur on a rolling basis between February and October. It's probably more realistic to think that any desk reviews would occur, would begin to occur sometime in March because you all have to get out there first and start um, cutting your teeth on completing some uh, IEAs. And then when we start to get that feedback, some determinations will be made on whether or not a desk review is necessary. If there is, um, a, if, if the desk review then verifies these inconsistencies and discrepancies or uncovers additional ones um, from the provider self-assessments, then the setting may also still be elevated to an on-site validation. So before we get into the nitty-gritty of the IEA, just want to pause again for a second and see if there is any uh, if there are any other questions, Kristen, that you want us to take at this time? Yeah, uh, thanks, Serena. So Krista has asked um, a couple of questions. I'm actually going to reverse the order because I think the second one is a nice segue into our next section. Um, but her first question is around um, what covered service under Section 13 would the individual experience assessment be considered? Um, 
and the question indicates monitoring and evaluation. And I can take a stab at that one. Great. Um, so yes, uh, definitely that the conducting, uh, the face-to-face -face conducting of an individual experience assessment is certainly considered consistent with assessment and monitoring activities under Section 13 for the purpose of you know, monitoring the members or the participants' uh, health and welfare, as well as assuring that services are being delivered consistent with the person-centered planning process. Um, so that's question one. The second question is around um, will case managers do individual experience assessments on people on their caseload, or will it be random? And so we've, Serena's already touched on the fact that the IEAs will be conducted on individuals who are in residential settings that are not getting an on-site validation visit. Um, but Ali is going to walk us through um, shortly how a case manager will know which individuals on their caseload fall into those settings. And I think that's all we have for questions at this point. Great, and that is a great segue into um, our our next major section of the training, which is giving you a detailed overview of the IEA process and um, what steps you'll take in completing IEAs. So uh, just a, a quick set of key principles, all of which probably will not come as a surprise to you all, and so we'll be quick about it. Um, but we do expect that all IEAs would be conducted face-to-face. -face. Um, we think that's a really critical component of the overall success of using this validation strategy. Um, we also believe that, um, I, that all individuals residing in residential settings that were not chosen for an on-site validation should have and will have the opportunity to engage and complete an IEA with their case manager and not with their provider. Um, it's going to be really important that they understand that, that that's done separate and distinct from, from provider, provider staff. So the IEA will be conducted in a private space separate from staff and other participants so the individual's responses remain confidential and thus the IEA has to be completed as a conflict-free assessment. Um, what that means, too, is that we all have to be very conscientious and intentional about how feedback is shared uh, with providers um, with respect to um, any inconsistencies between what the IEAs reveal um, and what the provider self-assessment responses were, particularly in settings where there's only one or two people. Um, I'm sure you guys are very savvy in that because you probably have to negotiate uh, those kind of conversations on a regular basis. Um, but we're just, you know, making sure that everyone's clear that, um, you know, information that's gleaned from the IEA is not to be shared uh, directly with the, the provider um, and that if there's issues that require um, additional work that that would be that would occur during the desk review in such a manner as not to uh, put the uh, participant in an unfair uh, or compromised position. So who should be involved in com when completing the IEA? Um, and the answer is it, it depends a bit. The individual obviously has to be involved and and they may choose someone in terms of natural supports to be engaged as well. Um, there's a couple of caveats around, around that. Um, uh, first off, guardians may be present during this process, but it's not a requirement that they be um, engaged. They can, they can participate in person or via telephone. So in other words, if you're going to visit someone you're, to conduct the IEA, and their mom, who's their legal guardian, isn't able to come because she lives an hour away, but she wants to patch in by, you know, Zoom or telephone or what have you. Um, that we, we want everybody to try to accommodate that within reason. Um, guardians that um, may, they may have a subset of guardians, so we, we certainly hope not, that might express concerns initially about the IEA and what it is and say, I don't want my you know, um, the person I'm responsible for to participate. 
And in those cases, um, it's, it's our collective responsibility to educate those guardians about what the IEA is and what it isn't and why um, participant engagement is so important as part of the ongoing home and community-based service provision process. Um, uh, so I, I understand that's probably an ongoing uh, 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 work in progress for how we do that. And it will be really important as we have touch bases with you all in the future to hear how it's going with the guardians their engagement and their interaction in completing the IEAs to get some, you know, uh, better sense from, from you guys about what the opportunities and challenges could be and what are some promising practices that we can share um, across the board with one another as we're kind of learning this together. Um, another area that we need to talk about is the role of the direct support professional uh, that might be working in an individual's home. Um, Overall, the general rule is that those direct support professionals cannot and should not assist with the assessment. Um, there is an exception that can be made, um, but only in the event that a non-traditional communication user relies heavily and is dependent on their DSP as a communications ally, and that both the individual and the individual's guardian, if there is one, has made the request that that direct support professional be engaged prior to the beginning of the IEA. Um, there is a caveat with that, and the caveat is that the state has to um, kind of run this through CMS just to give approval. We anticipate there will be. Um, it's a very insightful um, issue that Maine is bringing to the table as there hasn't been um, a lot of states that have kind of raised this question, but it's a very important one because we want to make sure that people who have uh, non-traditional communicative um, uh, skills, um, that they are allowed and engaged in this process as well. Um, so uh, this next slide is just about, you know, how, how do you engage the individual to kind of get them uh, get them to participate willingly and be open with you and, and give you the information you need to make this a worthwhile exercise. Um, so these are the same kind of things that you guys probably are experts in anytime you go to talk to a client and see how things are going or to revisit their person-centered plan or, or whatever the case might be. Um, but we encourage you to spend some time initially helping them understand why you're here for this particular visit and what what the IEA is, what types of questions you're going to be asking them, and why you're asking them so that it's a little less intimidating and that they don't have any, you want to reassure them that there's nothing for them to worry about in asking these questions or answering these questions. Um, we will have a one-pager. Um, Dr. Mills from our team has developed a wonderful one-pager that really helps explain um, the purpose of the federal home and community-based services rule in plain language and what it means to participants. So you can use that as well if you think that would be helpful, both for them but also for family members um, and, uh, um, and guardians. Um, in order to get them comfortable, you might want to just start the conversation talking to them a bit about things that you're already aware of in terms of what they like and don't like, how things are going in, in their, their setting and with their life. Um, and, and, you know, checking in on any important goals or activities that you know they really have been focused on from their PCP. Um, and, and then that's a great segue to kind of getting them to engage and interact in the IEA. If someone gets tired or agitated during the process, which we know that is going to happen, right, uh, with a number of people who just aren't going to have the stamina to get through the whole survey. And by the way, we anticipate the survey will take approximately 12 to 20 minutes per person, depending on um, the individual. Um, but if someone gets tired and agitated and they can't complete the entire survey, that is okay. That is not de it's not deemed a, a failure if you only get through half the survey. You just need to note where they stopped in the survey and provide this in the notes section. Um, allow, you know, make sure that you document uh, why this survey couldn't be completed in its entirety 
um, so that when it's uploaded into the portal, the people that are doing the analysis on the back end of these responses understand what happened. Uh, but we certainly want to take whatever uh, level of completion of a survey as we can because everybody's input is really important in this process. Uh, in terms of completing the IEA with folks that um, have no, non-traditional modes of communication, we really want to make sure that all efforts are exhausted to make it possible for them to participate in this process. And if the person has limited natural supports and also uses non-traditional modes of communication, we want to make sure that, um, that our, our teams are using evidence-based strategies to engage them to the best of your ability. Now, I should qualify that I myself am not a, uh, a, a, a subject matter expert in um, engaging individuals with non-traditional modes of communication. Um, so I feel a little hypocritical saying uh, you've got to, you know, use all evidence-based strategies and apply those when I myself am not an expert. Um, but I, I do, um, in the next slide, we're going to turn over to Kristen, and she's really thought through this for you and your team in a way I've seen very few, if any other states do, and has some ideas for, you know, really helping get uh, grounded as a, as a field um, and as a system in this, in, in this area. Um, if it's not possible to engage an individual in completing IEA in its entirety due to limited natural supports and non-traditional modes of communication, then case managers are instructed to do the following. You'll check um, most of the questions will have a yes, no, unsure that you would check, and then there will be a note section for each question where you will, you know, write in any additional details and information or context that the individual participant provides you when you ask that question. And so in this case, if someone's not able to engage um, due to limited natural supports or non-traditional modes of education, you'll check the unsure for each question that they were unable to answer. And in the narrative, you're going to put the same boilerplate language, you know, did not answer the questions due to typical communication resources, and you can say what those were, um, not participating in the assessment um, due to conflict of interest or whatever the case might be. If it's not possible to engage an individual in completing the IEA at all, then you're simply instructed to uh, still fill out the IEA with the individual's information, but then include a short narrative about why the IEA, uh, what, what the communication deficits were or challenges and why it was not possible to have the person assessed. That again is very important information and data for the state to have so that they can get a sense of the proportion of what, uh, of individuals who are not being adequately engaged because of uh, being a, a non-traditional communication user. And at that point, I'm just going to segue and turn it over to Kristen for a brief minute to maybe talk about the state's longer term goal and why, again, this data is so important to informing their longer term strategy. Thanks, Serena. So, as Serena's indicated, this is really an opportunity to hear from each and every person across the state around their experience in these settings. Um, and so, in terms of kind of the evidence-based strategies that Serena referenced, um, it's a really great place to reflect on those is through the, uh, the individual's non-traditional communication assessment that's been completed. So um, it could be strategies um, like visual gestural communication in, in sign language, or, or it could be in addition to that, you know, an app on their tablet and using symbol icons, et cetera. Um, and so we've already begun discussing with our non-traditional communication consultant for the state, Paula Matlins, through Mobius to help identify the fact that um, in order to truly engage with folks and, and learn their experience uh, for non-traditional communication users, we will we'll need to build up their non-traditional communication toolbox. 
uh, to include language that helps them express specifically their responses around their experience as it relates to HCBS. So, you know, it, adding um, words, obviously, with their permission or phrases to their augmented devices to help uh, be able to respond in a more meaningful fashion going forward. Um, but in the absence or in this interim period, certainly uh, refer to any uh, assessment, non-traditional communication assessment that's been done. Obviously reflect on your knowledge and experience with communicating with the person in general. Um, feel free to reach out to Paula if you would like to look at um, just consultation or updated uh, assessment that might help inform this process as we as we proceed forward. Great, and I, I just want to uh, give kudos again to Kristen and the state uh, for really thinking deeply on these issues. I uh, prior to working with the state, I was working at uh, at HHS helping. CMS uh, uh, support all 50 states in implementing this rule. I can't recall a single time in four and a half years that a state brought this issue forward. And I can assure you it's, it's a challenge in every state. So I, I just really commend the team for thinking about this and, and coming up with kind of a longer term goal and strategy for how we can all improve our engagement of this very important segment of your participant population. So now we'll, um, again, we have experience with piloting the IEA from last week. So we have literally three settings that we went to, okay? So this is not any kind of scientifically, you know, sound uh, sampling. This is just in our in our dry run. And when I say uh, it's piloting it, we did pilot the full IEA last week, so that we with the validation team that was doing the on-site vi visits from Disability Rights in Maine. Um, they're not going to be using that moving forward. They'll use a slightly shortened version. Um, but we wanted them to test the full one so that um, they, they actually wanted to, A, so they could see how long it was, um, and B, so that we could get some initial findings under our belt to share with you all today. Um, one of the things we realized is that it's really good to be able to review the most recent person-centered plan for each participant that you're interviewing prior to conducting the IEA. So in this case, the providers, we gave them a sample from the list of participants of people we plan to conduct an IEA for. They sent us their person-centered plans in advance so we could review them. Now, you guys are experts on a lot of these people's person-centered plans because you've been working with them for quite some time. And even if you're kind of new to a client, you, you know, you, you're really good at, you know, checking the PCPs in advance. So this probably seemed like a natural um, kind of, of course, we would do that moment. But just want to put it in there that out there that person center plans do change on occasion. If you haven't talked to the person in depth in a while or they've had some changes going on in their life, it just might be good to refresh because we know how large your caseloads are, that it's probably um, uh, tough to keep details straight sometimes about different people. Um, we, do, we did develop um, a section in the initial IEA that had some what I like to call lead-in talking points and questions um, for the larger survey questions in case you're struggling to get someone to engage or you feel like they want to engage but they don't quite know why you're asking something or what you're asking. Um, uh, we had some lead-in conversation points. Um, we pulled those out because it made the survey um, be a little clunky, but our intention is to take those and, and share a guide with you over the next few days that you can use um, at your leisure and interest, okay? So some of you are, uh, are you know, major league players in getting people to talk to you. You have strong rapport and relationships with these individuals. So you're not gonna need any of those prompts probably. Um, 
But some of you might have some new cases, you know, clients in your caseload that you don't know that well, or maybe, you know, you're new to the field and it would be helpful to have kind of a suggested uh, guide of talking points. You know, my suggestion on this is use whatever it's you find beneficial and useful and leave the rest on the shelf, you know, put put the rest to the side. Uh, this is just another tool for you to, to in case you need it. Um, we also really want you to make sure you're documenting all your responses to the questions, both by marking the specific response, but then really using that notes section. Oftentimes, an individual isn't going to just say yes, but they'll say yes and and give you some key you know, details or yes, but and might give you some caveats of when something is, you know, maybe some parameters that are being put in place around a certain expectation or expected settings criteria. That is very important detail. And we, so we really want to advocate for you to complete those as much as possible. So in terms of the process, the goal is to get a completed IEA from every individual that's residing in residential settings not receiving an on-site validation. And to have this completed by July, the end of July of 2020. Um, I'm sure everyone on the phone just had like a little skip of the beat in your heart there and a little panicky um, about that aggressive timeline. Um, I hear you. It is a very aggressive timeline. And we're extremely grateful uh, to you all and, under, and appreciative, especially in light of some of the other things we know that you have going on in the case management system in terms of systems change and some changes in introduction and new processes, et cetera. Um, the key is for us to be in really close communication so that if you are feeling overwhelmed or you're not meeting your kind of goals of the targeted number that you're going to complete, um, that you are sharing that with us because that information is important to share with the state. Um, the plans to assign case managers um, uh, and particular individuals on their caseload each month uh, based on each uh, on their residential provider and a specific list of settings they operate being selected for that month. So if, if in your area there are six providers and 18 agencies that, um, that we're trying to get through and you've got um, uh, clients in half of those, those will be the ones that will be probably on your priority list for that month. Um, each month, liaisons are, will notify you which providers and settings to dar target for completion of IEAs in that month. And you can start um, next week if you'd like. Um, uh, in fact, the sooner the better. Uh, we'd love to start to get you out there. Um, so that's the end of my uh, piece about just the process itself. Uh, any other uh, quick questions before I turn it over to Ali, who's going to walk you through the actual tool and uploading to the portal? Yes, Serena, we have a, a couple questions, I think fairly quick ones. Um, the first is, can parts of the individual experience assessment be done at different visits, or is it only as much as can be tolerated in one sitting? Wow, that's a great question, uh, and I don't have an exact answer for that because that is above my pay grade a bit. I think we need to take that back and get a question, an answer back to the team and the field as soon as possible. That is an excellent question. My, my gut says that if we're able to make that um, happen, uh, great, that logistically that might be kind of difficult given the compressed timelines. So I, I, I want to get some additional feedback from my colleagues at EconSys and the state and Kristen, and, and we'll get back to you on that. But excellent question. Thanks, Serena. And we also had a question from Josephine around Paula Matlin's contact information. I just wanted to alert people that information has been added to the chat box. Um, so just you can reference it there. Um, You mentioned that the state has to run guardian requests for DSP participation in an IEA with CMS. 
is this going to be a formal request the CM has to make, and if so, to whom? Will there oh. be a process to follow in making the request? Uh, great. Uh, okay, I'm glad you asked that because it means something I said wasn't clear. So, so just to clarify, uh, no, you will not. The state doesn't have to go through any formal process on a case-by-case -case basis about um, requesting guardians or DSPs be um, involved in the IEA process. Um, for for guardians, it it will be important and. I'm not entirely sure that we've figured this piece out, but it's going to be important that we alert guardians that um, you're, you're scheduling an IEA, it's coming up on such and such a date, and um, that if they want to be involved, they're certainly um, able to. Um, that's something you can move forward with immediately. Um, the, the issue about that I was speaking to about the state kind of talking to CMS is more about the role, uh, the in engagement of DSPs in, situ in the IEA process in situations where an individual that um, is a non-traditional communication user relies heavily on that DSP to communicate. And, and we're hoping that that is an exception that is applied very meagerly, that there are not that many cases in the system where that's going to be an issue. But in ones that are, it's important that you note that the, that the person has requested the DSP be there and that the DSP is engaged. Um, and we're going to spend some additional time on NTA on this issue uh, as it arises. But the caveat I made is that technically CMS has said very clearly that any consumer feed, um, surveys that are applied have to be done outside the presence of staff period, no exception. I think Maine has raised through your old feedback and expertise um, a scenario that is something that we need to take back to the federal government and say, what about these individuals? Uh, we want them to be engaged in the process, but here's the situation. So all I will say is that we have to put a pin on this right now, that this is subject to change. If you start doing IEAs next week and you have a situation where the DSP has to be there, go ahead and complete the IEA, but you need to make note of who was there, the DSP's name, who was involved in that, and that they, and it would also help to let us know, it, you know, what your perceptions were on, was the DSP really uh, communicating objectively um, what the individual was trying to say, um, or did it feel like the conflict, the inherent conflict of having the person in the room might have uh, yielded different answers. So this is a work in progress, this is a challenge that we're, we're kind of working through in real time, um, but by no means do you need to get um, permission in advance, you just need to notate in the, um, in the IEA when you upload it that, that a DSP person was present. And there really should not be a DSP person present except under very extraordinary circumstances like the ones I just described. Thanks, Serena. We do have several other questions, but I'm wondering if we should continue on and see if the next section answers some of them. Yeah, I think it's back. a good idea to go ahead and turn it over to Ali, and then we'll follow up with Q&A at the end. Great. Right. Thanks. So, Ali, do you want me to stop? I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can start sharing yours. Does that sound good? And Ali, um, if you're talking, um, we can't hear you. You probably need to do star six. No, it wasn't me. I was okay. uh, muted okay. by the administrator. Now you can hear me, right? Because I was given. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Ali Sayer from Economic Systems. We are located in Northern Virginia, 15 minutes from Washington, D.C. Um, let me share my screen first. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. 
Okay. So first, we will go over this um, portal that we have for the main HCBS compliance that we created um, last summer, this past summer. And because I know you have a lot of questions about the portal, how am I going to use it, sign on, sign in, um, uploading files, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, first of all, here's the URL right here. Let me see if I can move this thing here. Okay. Main.hcbscompliance.com. It's quite easy. We purchased this domain a while ago and picked the easiest one we could. Um, it's easy to remember. Main.hcbscompliance.com. So you will be receiving an invitation um, by email and it will have the instructions on how to sign on the portal for the first time. It's quite easy. It's going to be your email address as the username and then a password. Either we will uh, give you that pass password the first time and then you will go in and change it um, or you will create your own pass uh, password. So just um, probably over the weekend, no later than Monday morning, you will receive that email. And if you forget your password, you don't need to contact us directly by phone or email. It is through the portal right here, forgot your password. So you will get an automatic email with instructions how to reset your password or um, uh, maybe we will give you a temporary password in the same email. Any technical questions, you can send us an email at helpdesk at main.hbscompliance.com. That information is on the sign-in page as well. Okay, so uh, each case manager, care coordinator will have access to the survey instruments through the portal. That means once you sign in, you will see all the settings and individuals assigned to you to do this uh, IEA. So what does it mean? So you will see like a, um, it's not an Excel spreadsheet table, but in a row, you will see the provider name, address, possibly some numbers. It may not mean a lot to you, some ID numbers, but you will see uh, easily, you know, what is assigned to you to do uh, this IEA. Um, and you will click, and then you can download the file, the survey instrument, um, and um, you can save it on your laptop or tablet or have it print out um, just in case you want to have both. So let's say for next week you have two settings slash individuals assigned to you. Then you will see two separate survey instruments, which is uh, Excel file really, um, to download. And then let's assume that everything went fine. You completed an IEA for an individual at a setting. Then you will save that file with the name convention that we will talk about, which is gonna be like person ID and alphanumeric nine digit character set. Uh, it will be um, given to you and you will save that file and then sign in and upload that file uh, with click, click, couple clicks, and then you are done. So I'm working on a mini FAQ guide for this part of the IEA um, to provide you with quick answers. Um, you can print that one or save it on your um, laptop, tablet for reference. So you don't have to go through PPT slides or your notes to get help. Uh, hopefully it will be very useful for you. Hmm. 
So, um, IEA survey instrument. What does it look like? So I mentioned before, it's a fillable Microsoft Excel file. And again, one file for each interview assessment. Um, am I going to use the portal to enter responses for each IEA? Um, no, you will not. Um, you will only use the Excel file, which we call um, the IEA tool, uh, to enter responses directly into the Excel file. Now, if you say no, you're rather, um, during the interview, you rather jot down your um, interviewer's responses uh, on a piece of paper, the survey instrument, printed copy. That's perfectly fine, but that will double the effort because then we will ask you, um, or you will need to enter the same you know, responses, written responses into the electronic Excel file. Um, if there are no objections, um, it's better to use the Excel file during the interview, but it's very understandable that it may not be the case. Sometimes one-to-one -one interview survey that you may need to have a print copy of the survey instrument so you can mark your responses and then when you go back to your office or wherever is convenient, you can put those in your, um, in the electronic file, save and then upload. Um, I would like to walk you through this Excel file. I'm sure you are very uh, interested in seeing what it looks like. Um, let me see. Okay. All right. So let's assume um, you open the um, individual survey tool for an individual at a setting. And the first thing you will see, oh, let me ask, um, if the screen is too big or too small, uh, please someone let me know. Um, I can adjust it. I made sure that it's maximized on my screen, but it may not mean that uh, you have the same uh, experience. Let me see. Chat. So far it's pretty clear, Ali, thank you. Oh, good, okay. All right. So first you will see some um, verbiage that you can read you know, leisure later, and then some instructions about the timelines. Um, and so I put some information in blue boxes here. Save your file frequently and upload your completed survey. Here is the URL again, where you get on our sign in our portal. And here's the name convention. So assuming that this person, individual being interviewed has this ID, which is right here. So you will save your file with that number. That's all we need. That's a unique identifier for that individual at that setting. And here, row 11, I put key to colors in column D. This is where you enter responses. We will go over this. So there are basically two or three colors in this column. The gold or yellowish one indicates there is a drop down box in the cell. You will choose your responses from one of those drop down response values. If it's gray, that means you're going to enter text, free text. Um, so with that information, uh, let's go. Responses, uh, response to each question is required unless otherwise indicated. It means um, please try to get a response on each and every question unless there's a skip pattern, which is indicated in the instrument. Um, and it's okay to leave some responses, I mean, some questions blank, but please put any <clears throat> notes in this column, excuse me, <clears throat> in column E. 
Uh, section 1A is general information. This is the part we will pre-populate each IEA survey instrument or this file uh, with the information that we already know. We have this information. Person ID, setting type service location, that's a uh, provider index number with a three digit at the end that identifies that setting. So the first part is for the provider number and the last three is for the setting. You don't have to remember this or you don't need to know this, but just piece of information. Location, street address, that's where the services are being provided for that individual and location city. So these are of course not real city or street address, one this way to happiness. Um, <clears throat> provider name, and here's the um, CM, CC, ICS agency name. And if it's a section 21 or 20, 29 uh, waiver, and name of person conducting IEA. So that's your name, last name, comma, first name. So this will flow in this file. Um, so when you open the file, you will see this information. If any of this information is incorrect, please correct it in these cells here, E18 through E26. Another piece of information. So I'm gonna try to click somewhere here and you will see it's not selecting that cell. It's not selecting the cell either, but it's selecting this one. So that means you cannot make any changes in column C or D within these 18 through 26, because those are again, information put in there um, prior to, you know, you open this file. But again, if there's an incorrect information, you'll be able to go in and enter the correct information there. Section A2 is for you to answer. So we want your title, CM, CC, ICS. Okay, I'm gonna do the same thing. As you can see, column C, I can't click on any of these cells. However, E, yes, I can. And let's go, question 10, row 29, uh, 29 title. I clicked here and I see a little button here drop down box. So we have ICS, I mean ISC, I'm sorry, community case manager, care coordinator. Uh, for now, we have this on-site validator, but it does not apply to you. Probably I will remove that one. It's saved for or reserved for DRM validators. And then you will see, uh, you will select one. Let's say this one number of months working with a member, it's open text. So let's say nine. Um, since it's asking number of months, you don't have to type in nine months, just enter an integer or uh, it doesn't have to be integer, but a number. And then date, the survey started and completed. So one of you had a question about can we go back and finish the uh, survey or assessment uh, later? Do we have to do it at once, one day? Um, so we will get you an answer, but for now, uh, we thought about this and we put two date fields here. Survey started, survey completed. So uh, it could be the same date, of course, or if not, so you will put the date you completed the survey. Um, I will not go over all the questions here, but um, I will just talk about the skip patterns. Row 33, does the member have a guardian? Again, when I click here, yes, no, let's say yes. If Q14 is yes, answer the next question, which is 15, is guardian the uh, public or private? Public and so on. So every time you click on one of these cells, you will see a drop down and 
pick one. What happens if you really, let me delete this one, if you forget that there's, or you didn't see um, about this drop down box, you want to answer yes. So I'm trying, um, or I don't know. Here you enter, I don't know, let's say. Then you get a warning, wrong entry. Please use one of the response values provided. You say, oh, I have to go back, cancel, and see it deleted that entry, IDK, then you will say, oh, okay, I have, I'm limited to picking my response here. If your response doesn't fit in any of these for some reason, then we have the notes column here, um, E. That's where you can enter your notes or response. So you will leave this one blank in that case. Um, so that's the skip pattern. Here's another one. Um, one more piece of information before I show you this. So if you see a cell in black, that means no response is required there. You can click on it anyway, but that's an indicator that the question is about skip pattern, uh, uh, ask certain way. For example, if Q17 equal yes, that means if the response to Q17 is yes, then answer 18A and 18B. First and last name of person, so it's text. What is his, her relationship to the member? Then you will click one of these. Guardian, spouse, partner, other family, other. So the next line, row 42 says, if you selected other family as your response to 18B, previous question, then explain other family, meaning who is other family? Brother, sister, so on. Similar to here, if you picked, <clears throat> excuse me, other from, oops, other from the drop down box, then to 18B, explain what do you mean by other. Then the fun begins. You will start the interview. So there's a script here for you to read. Um, you will get used to this once you do a couple of them probably. Um, and I will not go over this um, because it's just text. Then you will say, okay, let's get started. Um, section B, well, there's only uh, section B in this one because this one is specific to um, the setting type shared living where the care river is related to the individual. So we will have another version for other type of residential settings. There'll be just one more. Uh, the first one is, um, even if you knew or you know how long the individual has lived there, still it would be nice to start the conversation, interview. How long have you lived here? And then again, uh, make sure you include, and sometimes you will see a pop-up like this. It reads, how long? Please make sure you include information whether the response is in weeks, months, or years. So you can put in here, since it's open text, nine months, 1.5 years, and so on. And the rest is divided into uh, the setting requirement numbers. They are all numbered. You will read setting was selected by the individual from among setting options, including non-disability specific settings. Um, and you will follow as they are, you know, these questions and the skip patterns. Um, and so there are 20 questions, basic questions, and then some skip patterns, of course. Then at the end, I repeated the same information, save your file frequently. Here's the naming convention. And here's the, um, the domain or URL that you need. And I will stop right here and see if there are any questions.
from the audience. Hi, Ali. We do have a question around, will the Excel file easily convert to Google Sheets? Um, definitely, yeah, we can do that. I need to run some tests because, you know, there's some compatibility issue between Excel and Docs. Some features are not available, or I need to modify the file to make sure that it works perfectly fine, just like in Excel. So I will get back to you on that definitely to make sure we have a version for you in Docs. So when you say Docs, of course, Sheets, right? Google Sheets. That was the question, yes. Okay. Um, a question around uh, whether or not conducting the assessment face-to-face -face is billable. I know that's probably not for you. Um, so yes, we covered that the face-to-face -face assessment is billable. The secondary piece of the question is the data entry not. Um, so I think Ali highlighted how we have an opportunity to complete the Excel version of the assessment um, and be able to directly upload that. So to the extent that while you're sitting with the person and are able to complete the assessment directly into the Excel file, it, the time spent with the person conducting the assessment would be billable. Um, to the extent that you may need to utilize um, the other version where you would write the answers down and bring them back to the office and need to unfortunately duplicate your effort. Um, or if I may, can they use yeah. um, combination? So um, I will go over what I mean. So these questions, most of them are yes, no, and you're selecting from the drop down box. So during the interview, you may want to use the Excel file at least to select these drop down response values, which is quick. However, for notes, comments, which may take longer, depends on um, your typing, you know, uh, speed or other factors. You may want to jot down these notes, comments on a piece of paper, but then please put down, of course, question number. In this case, on the screen, question 14, you know, write down, you don't have time to type in the Excel, that's fine. At least that way, when you go back to your office or somewhere else, then you can enter these handwritten notes into the Excel file. That may help. Great, thanks, Ali. Um, another question around the time frame for saving. Every five minutes, less, do you have a recommendation? Oh. That's for your benefit, really. I mean, if you have a very reliable tablet, uh, laptop, you can save it at the end of the interview, but we don't want you to lose any data. Um, that's why in case uh, the battery runs out or it doesn't save automatically uh, the information. So, you know, I don't want you to get frustrated. <laughs> um, that's why. So it's up to you, really. Five minutes is too often uh, for me. I would do maybe if I'm moving or taking a break, then make sure you save the file if you are taking a break uh, during the interview. Great. And another question about is the upload done on the portal at the same time the IEA is completed? No, it doesn't have to be. Again, you may want to uh, revisit your, uh, not your answers, but the responses, and just go over the file um, at your own leisure. Um, the deadline is really not by us, but um, I think you will work with, uh, I don't know, Kristen or some other colleague uh, here about, you know, how much time do you have to submit the file back to the portal once uh, it's scheduled and you're expected to complete the interview by a certain date, then how much time do you have between the time you complete and upload the file to the portal? Um, 
I would say that's TBD to be determined because for us, you know, uh, we don't have any limit as long as you meet your own deadline, uh, whatever it is, I don't know. Uh, we have a question from Doug. Are we getting the assessments for all consumers at the start or are they being sent a few per month, which would make it very difficult to manage? Um, so we could do either or both. Um, <laughs> I will go over what I mean. So I believe I have all the assignments um, for each case manager, CC, um, ISP. And um, so one approach is to share the information with you, no problem. However, um, if you are scheduled to do X number of uh, interviews, let's say in March, it's to your benefit to, for us to uh, give you access through the portal only to those um, survey instruments. And the reason is if you have, I don't know how many, let's say 40 assigned to you, then you don't wanna go through 40 and then select the ones just for March. So to me, it would be easier for you um, to view only like maybe monthly, we can decide on that again later. Um, is it monthly, two months, you know, all the assignments or two weeks. Uh, again, let me discuss it with my colleagues and uh, get back to you on that. Kimberly would like to know, what if the member is not local and Skypes with the CM? Does the interview still need to be face-to-face? -face. Okay, that question maybe uh, Kristen or someone else can take because I don't know. I thought it was required face-to-face. -face. Um, I don't have the answer. Uh, this is Serena. Face-to-face -face is the requirement, but if there are situations where a CM typically engages with the person via Skype or Zoom, I think it would just um, maybe make sense for us to talk with the state and see if there's a process for you flagging those individuals and just requesting permission up front uh, to do those virtually. Okay. Um, we have a question about, are we taking into account internet access that one cannot hotspot from their smartphone. This access would be for our laptops. Um, that's one reason why we did not make this tool available through the portal to enter data directly into the portal because uh, we were given that information. It's not that at, at an individual level, you, don't have, you may not have access, but we heard that Maine, state of Maine has a lot of um, dead spots where there is no internet access or wherever uh, some places there is, it may be problematic. So you are not uh, expected or you don't have the um, capability at this point, the tool doesn't have the capability to enter the data directly into the pool uh, portal. So that's why you're gonna use the Excel file, which is gonna be stored on your tablet or laptop and you will use your you know your own uh, device save it then wherever you have internet access you will sign in the portal just to upload that excel or google sheets file okay thank you ali um, we do have a fairly substantial number of additional questions, and unfortunately, we're running up on the end of our training session. Um, we will definitely be capturing any and all questions that have arisen out of today's discussion um, and using those questions to help inform ongoing community of practice calls. Um, Serena, do you have time to kind of wrap up with the final resources for folks um, as we near the end of our training today?
And if there are any questions about my portion here, I can provide written responses and maybe you can send out an email uh, with those responses. Thank you, Ali. You're welcome. Serena, yeah. oh, great. Oh, go ahead, Kristen. I was just checking to see if you were back with us. Thanks. <laughs> I, uh, I'm sorry, I got knocked out for a second, and then when I came back in, I wasn't able to get unmuted. Um, yeah, so it might be good maybe to even talk about um, if, and, and Ali, do you still have your screen up? Uh, yes, I could share, sure. Yeah, could you just leave it up there and maybe we could just go over the last couple of slides, but maybe talk about, because that's a good way to talk about maybe next steps and a, a way to continue this conversation so that we're able to um, answer people's questions in sure. time. Tell me which screen you want and I will. Great. Um, it's slide 35. I'm sorry, what is 535? Uh, slide 35. Oh. <laughs> post scan for okay. after validation. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so just running through really quick for you all. Typically, um, providers will receive the results of a setting validation within 30 days of the process being completed. Obviously, if it if it's elevated to a desk review or an on-site visit, that information would be communicated during that time. Um, but based on the setting validation results, each setting is going that has areas that they need to work on because they're partially or non-compliant will be required to have a setting specific transition to compliance plan. And then providers will have 30 days after that. That actually might get moved. I think that might be 30 to 60 days after that to submit an approvable transition to compliance plan for the setting. Um, and then at that point, those plans have to be fully implemented by October of 2021. And the state will have a monitoring system in place along with EconSys to check in on important milestones and during that phase with each provider to make sure they're making progress and making those remediations. Obviously, if they don't or are unwilling to make those modifications uh, to comply with the rule, then they will no longer be required. Um, uh, uh, a, um, eligible for becoming an H being an HCBS provider um, in uh, in after the transition date of March of 2022. So this slide just gives you some additional resources um, based on today and some things that are coming. And so again, uh, we'll have like a one-page info sheet that you can use with um, participants to help explain the purpose of the IEA and the rule. Um, Ali spoke that he's working on a, a portal user's guide and FAQ guide. Um, we will also be um, providing a, um, uh, the guided script for those that want to use that. It's just an additional resource or tool for your toolbox. Um, we, there are plans the state is going to be working on updating their person center planning manual in the future in 2020, and so that will be, you know, more to come on that. But the last thing I wanted to say is we're, you know, we're planning to host a virtual community of practice to allow case managers and care coordinators to come in and ask questions in real time. We'd love feedback from you all on how frequent those should be um, and because we really do want to get, you know, your questions answered. So, Kristen, we can follow up at the conclusion of this, but it might make sense to get another call on the book sooner than later so that we can take all of these questions that we've captured to the chat, chat box and not only make sure to get back to people in writing, but also to create some space to, to um, dialogue about those. Absolutely, Serena. We've had some really um, thoughtful questions come up today and definitely we'll be reaching out um, to schedule those calls and uh, use those questions to help inform topics on uh, upcoming monthly calls. So thank you for that. Um. No problem. And thank you all today for your time. I know that was an intense uh, training, but we're just delighted to have you engaged in this. And Kristen, thank you for your leadership and for allowing us the opportunity to provide the training today. 
Well, thank you, Serena, and thank you, Ali. We want to very much um, extend our appreciation for your leadership and guidance to us as we move through, through this very intensive and targeted um, process. Um, I am seeing a couple of additional questions pop up around how to access the PowerPoint and resources. Um, as I indicated, following today's webinar, we will be posting the recording as well as the PowerPoint and the tool resources that um, both Serena and Ali highlighted uh, for us today. So we, you can expect to receive additional communication on where to find those resources on the O's website. Um, and just in closing today, um, please note in the chat box, there has been a hyperlink identified if you are interested in um, obtaining a certificate of attendance for today's training. You'll find there are just a handful of questions in there uh, to respond to, and that certificate will be generated for you directly. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for your participation today. Um, I, this will end our, our training on the home and community-based settings rule and the uh, jumping off our, our individual experience assessment process. Thank you all. Have a Thanks, great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.